to our panel, um, Professor Zhao Wang. Uh, do you want to introduce yourself? Okay, so um, um, I'm a chief science officer uh, at SimWave, um, and at the same time, I'm a professor at the University of Waterloo. So in the past uh, 20 years or so, I have been working on uh, perceptual um, image and video quality assessment and perceptual optimization. So SimWave is providing uh, the industry with a solution uh, to do video quality assessment and optimization. If you want to know more about SimWave, uh, please visit uh, booth uh, 217. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Joe. And we also have Scott Labrosi. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Scott Labrosi. I'm a senior principal engineer and the VP for the video processing team at BAMTech, uh, which just means I'm also, not only do I manage the team, but I'm also the lead architect and lead developer. Um, I've been in, uh, in the video domain for, um, for probably about 28 years now. Um, and throughout my career, I've both built video encoders and video technology. Um, and then I've also many times have licensed it as well. So I've gone through um, probably maybe about every half decade or seven years, another set of encoder evaluations in, in, the, in the parts of my business where I've done licensing. Thank you. And Anne? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ann Aaron. I'm Director of Video Algorithms at Netflix. So our team does the encoding of video and images on our service. So basically our goal is to be able to uh, serve, deliver the best quality video streams that our members watch. Fantastic. So we have some of the world's leading experts on evaluating video here. And we hope to make this presentation kind of a how-to, a tutorial. Um, hopefully you'll learn a thing or two uh, to help you uh, in your practical work. Um, we're going to just focus on the pure qualities of video encoders. We're um, agnostic to video coding standards. This isn't going to be uh, an HEVC versus AV1 discussion. Um, we're going to be agnostic to hardware versus software. The title, of course, of the panel is, is how to evaluate software encoders, but uh, many of these techniques will be useful to evaluate hardware encoders if that's uh, one of your options. And uh, we won't focus on all those other things that if you were doing a commercial selection, you might focus on cost, um, you know, support from the vendor, commercial versus open source, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll give a little presentation that we've all worked together to prepare, and then we'll have some panel discussion and take questions from the audience. So let me turn it over to Scott. He'll go over a few things. <coughs> Great. So let's, uh, let's start off by defining a couple of key uh, attributes of encoders when we think about quality. Um, so certainly when you, the, the first word that comes to mind when most of you probably think of the word quality is visual quality, right? What is either the subjective or objective quality of something? Um, but you can't really take that uh, by itself. You have to understand, well, what was the number of bits that actually produced that quality, right? Um, and then not only that, you have to also understand, well, what did it take to actually produce that visual quality at that bits? And that's what we call performance, encoding performance. Um, so these two key factors, both the compression efficiency, as well as the compression performance are key elements. I mean, when you look at compression performance, you just can't look at frames per second. You have to really understand what was the compute, what number of cycles it took to actually produce that result, okay? Now, there are a number of key elements of our key properties of, of encoders. Um, many of them, many encoders share a lot of these common factors. Um, but you need to be aware of them because all of them inherently will have an impact both on quality, um, on the bits expended, um, as well as in performance. So the configurability, the dynamic configurability of encoders is key. Um, we've talked about quality at bit rates, and so being understand the rate control modes of encoders, the accuracy that they, they have um, is key. Uh, much encoding um, and the, the, the ability to produce really quality video um, comes from being able to know what's coming in the future. So look ahead processing is one of the key elements um, as well. Um, and of course, the performance, you know, we're in the age of very high density multi core machines. So, how those um, encoders use those cores, um, both for VOD and for, for live, uh, is key. Um, and we're now in an age where high dynamic range is coming on the scene. And so, um, there are nuances that are, we're still trying to assess um, how to, to, to look at high dynamic range video. So um, this is not a full set in terms of your design setup when you go off to evaluate an encoder, but here's, you know, here are some of the basics. And we're going to cover uh, many of these bullets um, in subsequent slides. So the team panel has broken up some of these to talk about them discreetly. So in terms of choosing the appropriate source content, 
um, understanding and choosing the appropriate bitrate models, especially in the streaming space where many of us will be doing adaptive bitrate, and so we're not just encoding for one particular target, but for lots of different targets, and across those targets are lots of different resolutions as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, in a moment about some of the nuances between live assessing encoders for live versus on demand. Um, and then again, you know, this, this whole notion of adaptive bitrate and, you know, what are you doing from, a, from, are you doing just one resolution, or are you doing multiple resolutions simultaneously, and what the implications of that have on the evaluation process. Um, so ultimately, you're, there's going to be a design setup in which you're just setting up and configuring your encoders for work, and then on the backhand side of it, you're obviously going to go off and evaluate. And so there's a number of nuances in terms of how you go out and evaluate content, whether you're doing um, uh, subjective versus objective. Um, we'll talk about some of the trade-offs therein during our discussion today. Um, I've already touched a little bit on performance and uh, efficiency. I'm going to cover that a little bit more in the next slide. And of course, we're here we're talking about video, so we're not talking about just still frame analysis. So that's a whole different topic. Um, so we need to be evaluating video for video's sake, and I know that Tom has a slide that he'll cover some more details on that. Um, it's also the case that many encoders can be tuned specifically for um, objective measurements, and you have to be careful in terms of, of, of utilizing that. Um, ultimately, you're going to be using this in production, and so you need to be tuning it and most appropriately how you'll ultimately be using this in your own production environments. Um, and because we're in this, you know, uh, not only an adaptive bit rate weight mo uh, world, but we have a plethora of different devices from your cell phone to your large screen TVs, you know, how, you know, when you're doing your encoding, how you evaluate the end results. You know, are you evaluating a small resolution on, a, on, a, on just only on a, on, a, on a cell phone, or are you looking at that you know, low bit rate, low resolution also on a, on a high-end display. Um, so those things come into play as well. Tom? So let's talk a little bit more about this, this performance versus efficiency um, aspect. So we've, we've already talked about the word performance. I've defined that as relatively, you know, what is the frame rate for the amount of compute, right? And efficiency is basically what kind of quality you get for uh, at a particular bit rate. Um, so these two things are highly tie tied together. Um, so video encoders, you know, their job basically is to compress, to make things smaller, right, make video smaller. And the way that they do that is there's a lot of analysis that's going on um, to try and do that work. And you, uh, video encoders, the syntax of a video encoder, basically list of various different tools that you can apply, different type of prediction modes that you can use, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, one, an encoder could potentially be used to just exhaustively look at every different possibility. Uh, and, and in practice, that's just not feasible, right? So even if you're just doing a, a video on demand service and, uh, and you, maybe if you have just one title, that, that's all that you're doing, something not at scale, then maybe you can you know, spend the time to do an exhaustive type of encode, but that's not practical. So whenever you're doing an evaluation or where you're gonna put this in production, you're always concerned about, well, exactly what, how much can I do within a certain amount of time? And so all encoders have various different tools that you can enable or disable. Um, uh, some tools have different levels, you know, so ME, motion estimation, is just like one of the simplest ones that I think many of you might be able to understand. Um, so being able to find that right configuration that's balancing performance um, versus and speed um, versus the quality that, that results from that. Now ultimately you may be not only just evaluating one encoder, you may be evaluating multiple encoders against one another. Um, and, and this is again where the performance and efficiency come into play. You can't just look at two different encoder results and compare them without taking into consideration the performance factor, right? So an encoder, for example, that produced stellar quality, maybe it took two days to produce that, and another one produced mm, maybe 10% of that, not quite the same quality, but it did the work in much less time. So it's key to be able to interpolate between both the performance and the quality when doing your evaluation. So I mentioned I'd talk a little bit about this. Now in my business, um, especially at BAM Tech, uh, the majority of our encoding um, and, and is for li linear and live events, so um, versus VOD. We do but we do VOD as well. So, um, and there are different you know criteria when you're evaluating an encoder for the differences between live versus VOD. So live um, and linear, which is a uh, linear TV 24/7. Um, it's it's obviously just real time, right? So that the content is being delivered to you're ingesting it in real time. You have to process it in real time. Um, and so that's a key element. You can't go faster than in real time, um, and you can't go slower than real time. If you go slower, well, then your input backs up, and ultimately you're going to drop something on the floor. Um, and it's also the case in the linear space, we're mostly concerned about channel density. So how many concurrent uh, ABR stacks can we put on a given system at, at a given time? And so that has a lot of impl more implications. It is the case that in VOD, you, you can tend to go slower than real time and tune slower than real time and get better quality results. So in the live case, there's a much, much harder balance between 
What can I effectively do? What kind of quality am I willing to, to yield while still having real-time performance and also having the, the maximized um, channel density? Um, and this is something that, that changes. You know, if we look at Intel year to year to year to year, there's evolutions in terms of the compute available. Um, and so when we go off and are producing some type of evaluation in another year from now, we'll evaluate again. And we're saying, even if we're not even changing the codec, um, we may be saying, all right, so what now with this new compute available to us, you know, do we make trade-offs? Do we increase channel density or do we actually try and increase quality? So um, the work of doing quality assessment is not something just ends, you know, in a, in a front-end period uh, uh, during a codec evaluation. Um, it's something that lives and breathes and we do this um, yearly. Um, in the VOD space, um, as I mentioned, you, you have the opportunity to go slower than real time. Um, we more often measure content hours per day, so we're not looking so much at how many channels, concurrent channels can we do on a picture system. We're looking at, you know, the throughput overall. Um, sometimes some of our business partners have turnaround time, so there is sometimes some um, notions of maybe not real time, but throughput hours. Uh, and then one major difference between VOD and linear is that VOD offers often, you know, the ability to do multiple passes to improve quality. So doing a pass first to assess seeing complexity, seeing changes, content, et cetera, and then um, uh, appropriately either choosing GOP structures or allocating bits dynamically across these scenes. Um, we've seen this become more and more prevalent in the last number of years with content of adaption and scene adaption um, encoding, and uh, my colleague Ann will be talking a little bit more of that in detail in a moment. Tom, let's hand it back to you. Okay, so uh, that's a little bit about uh, what you're gonna consider. Um, now you're gonna set up a test, right? And uh, to design your test, one of the first things you'll have to choose is what video am I gonna use to do that test? Um, we call those videos source sequences because a, a video is a sequence of still images. Um, but this is a basket of clips that you'll choose and you'll want that basket to be representative of the total population of video that your service will encode. So you'll want to include uh, that whole variety. Um, you may have some talking head video like news uh, casting, um, sports, dramatic you know, movies, action. You may have some grainy or noisy video, um, easy to encode, cell animation. And you'll want uh, the right uh, selection of clips in your, in your test to represent all of those things. Um, if you're doing sort of an academic test, let's say you're testing uh, two different encoding standards um, and you're gonna publish those results, you're gonna want to use very, very high quality, the, the best possible source sequences. Um, for example, Netflix was kind enough to put in the public domain um, their El Fuente and some other uh, fantastic uh, video sequences captured with super high quality, I think red cameras. Um, and they're available for free to download on ziph.org, xiph.org. Um, and they're, they're a fine example because also they're publicly available so other people could reproduce your test results if you published all the settings of your test. Um, and so you don't wanna give uh, your test uh, encoders content that's already been encoded first maybe with a consumer camcorder which has uh, you know, uh, not the best encoders built into that camcorder and then worse yet, uploaded to some sharing service and then re-downloaded. Uh, that's not how you wanna do your test. Um, now if you are testing for your own internal production environment, you're gonna wanna use video that's representative of what you're normally gonna receive. And that may include stuff that was recorded on consumer camcorders. And that may include video that um, is grainy or noisy or has other, other issues. So, Chances are you've saved over the years some of those examples that gave you fits and were those worst case examples and you'll wanna throw that at your new encoders to see how they handle those, those issues. Now rate control uh, is a topic we could have a whole presentation or two on separately but we will just give you the basics here but it's, it's very important, right? We're talking about controlling the bit rate and you wanna choose what types of rate control you wanna use for your test um, there are two basic types. One is uh, kind of constant quality. Um, constant QP or CQP is, is the you know, simplest. Um, QP is that parameter inside the encoder that uh, determines the level of quantization, but it, there's also a lambda table that determines the trade-off between bitrate and quality in the prediction phase of encoding. And academics always use constant QP for their tests that they publish. Uh, if you download papers, chances are 
those tests were done with constant QP mode. Um, there are, the other big area is uh, average bit rate. This is where you put a bit rate target in and there's a control system that will drive QP up or down in order to achieve some overall average bit rate. And the window that we measure that bit rate, uh, how are we doing, do we need to go higher or lower, that may be a narrow window. In, in other words, I want a very constant bit rate and I, I never want the bit rate to fall below that, too far below that target and of course I never want it to exceed that target. Um, or it could be a wide window, uh, many, many seconds, in which case um, uh, it's more variable and I'm allowing the bit rate to vary and that gives an overall better quality, um, but still we'll try to achieve an overall average target. Um, there's other variants like two-pass ABR where a first pass will do an assessment of the complexity of every frame and then in the second pass it'll come back and try to normalize quality. Um, and there's constant rate factor which is like constant QP but there's a, a rate factor that's measuring the detail and motion complexity and trying to achieve an overall constant subjective quality. Um, and then there's VBV, Video Buffer Verification, and this is like a traffic cop. This is in addition to a primary rate control mode. Uh, this will stand by and, and see whether the parameters that you've entered are being violated or not, uh, potentially violated, uh, the maximum buffer size and the fill rate of that buffer. And if the VBV parameters would be exceeded, VBV takes over, takes the wheel, uh, controls the bit rate until such time as the primary rate control would adhere to the VBV parameters. So it's an either or kind of rate control mode. So one thing to keep in mind is that you give any encoder enough bits, the video will be vi visually lossless. So if you're doing subjective testing later, you won't see a difference. Um, so you'll want in your test res uh, design to use some bit rates that are kind of pushing encoders uh, harder, uh, lower bit rates, and there you'll see the differences between two different encoders um, that will be more apparent. Um, of course, you'll want to encode to the whole range of bit rates that you'll, you plan to use in production. Now, the other big area to understand is subjective versus objective. Um, subjective meaning humans uh, gave it a score uh, using their eyes and their brains. Um, this is the gold standard. This is ultimately what your clients or, or customers are seeing. Uh, they're not seeing PSNR scores or SSIM scores. They're watching video. And if you want to know whether the video looks good, you have to look at the video. And this is the gold standard, but it is time consuming. Um, it's not practical at large scale in a production environment. Um, it's, it's practical for smaller tests, uh, some reasonable number of tests, but if you really want to do a very thorough analysis with many, many hundreds of encode iterations, uh, it gets expensive. It just takes a lot of time for each individual subject and then many subjects to come in to have a whole range of scores that you can then average out and, and, and try to arrive at the real truth. Um, there are ways to sort of scale subjective testing. Uh, my company, Beamer, has developed a, a web-based tool called Beamer Vista that enables that to be you know, a little bit more productive. And you could use Amazon Mechanical Turk to pay people to do that for you. Uh, so there are ways to scale it up uh, to try to be cost efficient, but in a live production environment, this is not something you can do. Uh, you need objective measurements. Uh, using mathematical algorithms to arrive at a score that hopefully closely approximates what humans would have judged that video to be. And we have two of the world's foremost experts on objective metrics, uh, the inventor of SIM and the uh, leader of the VMAF uh, algorithms here with us today. Um, the cool thing about objective measurements, of course, they're reproducible. You give the same video to the same measurement tool, you'll get the same result each time. Um, they can be scaled up, computers do all the work. Um, the correlation varies, but there's been great work done over the years, and, and this is getting better and better all the time. So if you're doing subjective evaluation, if you want to publish test results, and you really, really want to know that uh, the results are 
uh, as academically accurate as possible, then you'll want to follow guidelines. Um, the ITU publishes two different uh, specs. One is an older standard and one is a newer standard, um, and they're outstanding. They go through everything you'll want to consider, um, the selection of source sequences, your test design, um, the, the viewing conditions, your instructions to the subjects who are doing the measurement, um, your statistical analysis, everything is in there. Um, this is the right way to do it if you're publishing a paper. But if you're just uh, a video expert in, in a company that's doing this and you want to uh, be a little bit more practical, um, you'll probably have uh, some combination of in-house experts looking at the video and, and making assessment or maybe some random subjects that you bring in who represent end users who are not so trained as to what to look for but will let you know uh, if they see things or they don't see issues. Uh, or which video they like better. Uh, my company, Beamer, makes a, a tool that enables um, playback of two videos frame synchronized side by side uh, called Beamer View. And, and this is a great tool. This probably won't play uh, at full speed here, but um, hopefully you can get the idea. Uh, you can have two videos that you're viewing side by side. You can uh, wipe this back and forth as you're playing, and of course it's not playing at full frame right here. This is a 60p video. Um, so if you're playing you know, 4K 60 video, you'll need a, a, a higher end desktop to make sure your, the software decoding of both sides is done in real time. But it's a great tool. It has a bunch of different modes. Um, you can hook it up to two TVs and, and uh, add a time delay so people could look at one and then immediately uh, see a second example of the same thing. So, you know, we try to make it uh, much more feasible to do subjective video quality evaluation, and, and I think it's, it's very, very important to have this as part of your assessment, because uh, ultimately it's what, what matters. Um, as we mentioned, video must be evaluated as video. It's tempting when you have a tool like Beam Review to uh, pause, to dive in into the details of how that encoder is working and, and look for little spatial artifacts. Um, you'll see all the details, right? But um, frame by frame, you'll, you'll see things that people, the average person especially, would never ever see at full frame rate. Um, and video encoders need to be allowed to use these tricks, these techniques. They need to be able to know, uh, to some extent, what is going to be visible as video and what's not. Um, these aren't still images, this is moving pictures. So the other side of things is if you're focused on still frames, you will miss motion artifacts. Um, there are settings on encoders that uh, can cause blocks of pixels, pieces of the scene essentially, to stay in one place when they should be moving smoothly or to move in some sort of jerky fashion. Um, there's all types of motion artifacts that may occur if you're sitting there uh, putting a magnifying glass on still frames, you'll miss those things. So resist the temptation uh, as much as you can. So let me uh, hand it over to Professor Zhao Wang, who is uh, going to talk a little bit more about objective metrics. All right. So um, talking about the objective uh, video quality metrics, and PSNR has been used extensively in the past 40 years by video engineers to uh, design video coding algorithms and evaluate them, right? So uh, PSNR indeed has a lot of um, advantages. It's uh, very simple, very easy uh, to compute, and very easy to understand. Basically what it does is uh, first compute mean squared error, right? So you have uh, the reference video and then you have test video, one subtract the other, you square them and you, you take the mean of that, and then that mean squared error can be uh, directly converted into PSNR, right? So the only disadvantage, actually, for PSNR is it doesn't predict perceived image and video quality, right? So here I'm giving a visual example. So the top left picture is the original Einstein picture, and I also have five versions of altered or distorted Einstein images. And the common thing about these five uh, distorted uh, images is that they almost have the same uh, PSNR, right? So. Uh, if you look at the number, actually, at the bottom left, the JPEG compressed images has a little bit higher PSNR. It means that it has the best quality, right, so in terms of PSNR. So, but when you look at the pictures, that's ridiculous uh, prediction, right? So 
uh, this, uh, this observation actually motivated us to uh, develop something different called structural similarity. That's uh, around the year of 2001 to 2004. So the purpose is to, pr uh, to produce a, a, a different uh, image quality metric that can predict perceived image quality. So uh, the structural similarity method end up with something that's still very fast, uh, easy to understand, easy to implement, and it also has very few parameters, right? So it's compared with the um, uh, extremely complicated human visual system, other human visual system model, it's still uh, very simple and easy to understand. Because of that uh, advantage, uh, structural similarity has actually been used to um, optimize video encoders. So for example, if you look at X264, X265, you have this uh, SSIM2 uh, mode you can choose. And if you look at my publications, we have been using structural similarity to, to optimize perceptual video coding. Uh, we have quite many papers uh, published uh, if you're interested. So structural similarity uh, is widely uh, uh, cited in academia. It's by far the most, most cited paper in the field in academia and also widely accepted by the industry and with a uh, uh, 2015 primetime Emmy Award. Right, so, but this is something that uh, we have been working on like more than 15 years ago. So it, what, what did they do uh, uh, in the past 15 years? Actually, we keep working on this. There are many, many uh, more advancement uh, in the field. And uh, so the recent thing that we are uh, pushing on is a, a new metric called SimPlus. SimPlus actually adding a lot more features um, about human visual system modeling into the framework and uh, is uh, doing a much better job. If you look deep into uh, uh, SimPlus, then it actually consider multi-resolution analysis, visual sensitivity, visual masking, spatial temporal behaviors, impairment visibility, viewing conditions, viewing device uh, conditions, and visual attention modeling, right? So there are so many things in uh, SimPlus. Here, I'm just giving you uh, some examples to give you a, f a flavor about uh, what's inside SimPlus. So the top left picture, uh, if you look at that, it has a lot of uh, distortions. Uh, I think even for people sitting in the back, you can see uh, the blocking artifact in, in the sky. And actually, if you look, at, look down there, uh, the, the bottom part, the, all the details, fine texture in the buildings has been smoothed. Right? So uh, then if you look at uh, the right picture, top right picture, that's the, what we call the quality map produced by SimPlus. It, uh, here, brighter means better quality. So this SimPlus is actually giving you per pixel predictions about the perceived uh, image quality. There you see the blocking artifacts has been very clearly identified. Right? So that's one thing we do in, in SimPlus. So the bottom one is an example that uh, SimPlus is actually predicting um, what we call the attention, attention map or saliency map. That predict where the humans will look at this picture. So there are places people never look at. There's places people spend a lot of time looking at, and that that is a place that draws more attention. And also, this uh, attention model would be affected by compression as well. So if somewhere is compressed too much, you, you see a lot of artifacts distortion. That thing itself will attract some attention. So. The, the bottom left picture uh, is the, the compressed uh, frame, and the bottom right tells you where are the places people are more likely to look at. Right? So these are just some examples inside SimPlus algorithm. We have many, many other maps in the algorithm. Then we combine them together into, a, into a, a sim, what we call SimPlus method. So uh, uh, an important thing I want to mention is that SimPlus is a human visual system model-based uh, approach. It, it, the, core, the, the, the very core part of SimPlus does not rely on any training. There are s s many advantages of, of method not relying on training. So uh, because the training set is extremely expensive. Say, for example, if you train a model for X, uh, H.264, compression, right? So that's already a lot of job. You, you need to have a lot of video and, and collect subjective scores and train your model. But what if you, you want to apply the model to HEVC, AV1, or ProRes, or JPEG 2000, right? So does it work? And because the, the, the algorithms never seen, have never seen these kind of distortions, how can you expect them to work on these new compression uh, artifacts, right? So SimPlus, on the other hand, does not rely on, uh, rely on this kind of training data. It's based on human visual system models. So it naturally, when we test it in 
uh, different scenarios, not only all these kind of compression artifacts, but also if the pictures got blurred, got noise, and all those kind of things, uh, it works automatically. So, so that's a big advantage of uh, the core algorithm based on human visual system. Right, so, um, and we have done quite a lot of tests of uh, SIM+. Um, a recent study is that we collect all the possible independent uh, public, uh, public, publicly available databases with subject ratings, and then we compare uh, all state-of-art state uh, video quality metrics, and it turns out SIM+, is the only metric achieving, on average, 0.9 correlation with uh, the mean opinion score. Right, so the left picture gives you an example. Horizontal is an objective quality uh, prediction by SIMPLUS. The vertical is the average uh, human subject rating called uh, mean, uh, mean opinion score. So ideally, you want all the uh, points, each point representing one test video. You want all the points to be aligned on a diagonal, law, uh, a diagonal line. Right? So of course, that's something impossible, but you want the cluster to be as tight as possible so that objective model can do a very good prediction of the, the, of the subjective rating, right? So this gives you pretty high correlation, in this case, uh, greater than 0.97. Uh, and also, uh, SIMPLUS, another advantage of SIMPLUS is still extremely fast. It's uh, faster than real time. Actually, because of these features, high accuracy and speed, high speed, uh, SIMPLUS has been deployed in large scale. Now, uh, we, ha we have people running SIMPLUS um, uh, for thousands of channels, uh, uh, real time, 24 seven. So basically with SIMPLUS, it's not about uh, when you uh, test a video encoder, you pick 10, 10 second uh, sequence, you think it's their representative and then you do some testing uh, and make all your decisions based on this testing with 10 sequences. Now you're talking about, you evaluate uh, all the video you have, right? So 24 seven, thousands of channels, all the videos, you're gonna compute the scores, you're gonna do a, a very fair evaluation of all this content you have, right? So um, actually in addition to this, SIMPLUS has many, many uh, additional uh, benefits. For example, it's, it's doing meaningful um, uh, consistent com comparing across content, across resolution, across dynamic range, uh, across viewing device, across uh, uh, viewing conditions. So for example, if you have a video that uh, the reference video you are trying to compress has high resolution, what if you transcode that into multiple different resolution, much lower resolution, how are you gonna compare input with output? They don't even have the same number of pixels. You can't even compute PSNR or structure similarity. But SIMPLUS have all these models uh, in there. What if the input output is not temporarily aligned with each other? SIMPLUS will help you do that. So it covers all these uh, conditions. In addition to that, SIMPLUS is also gonna first evaluate the source, so, uh, no reference quality assessment of the source input video first. And then it is computing perceptual fidelity between input and output and then have an overall evaluation of, of your test video. So, because a lot of time, this is a common question uh, people are asking, a lot of time uh, you got bad quality compressed video not because your, your encoder is not good, it's because the source is bad, right? So you want to have, figure out what, what is the, the, the reason uh, to blame if anything bad happening, right? So it's, and also SIMPLUS has been uh, combined into client-side um, uh, evaluation. Say, for example, you, you're, you're streaming a video, you have some freezing event, you have quality switching from high to high, uh, high to low and low to high, and how these will affect the overall quality of experience. And SIMPLUS has been combined uh, everything there into the same framework. So basically, uh, SIMPLUS is really a comprehensive uh, uh, approach that uh, tells you uh, what's happening about your video quality. Right? So here, uh, uh, one more slide, I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, how you're gonna use SIMPLUS to do encoder optimization. So because of Sim, uh, SIMPLUS is so, uh, so fine, has so fine uh, granularity, so basically you can, you can do uh, per title, per channel, per scene, per, per gob, per frame, per block, even per pixel quality evaluation. So depending on at which, which scale you want to uh, uh, optimize your encoder, you can choose the right scale to work with. So here, i just give you one more example, right? So here, we're, we're talking about um, the same, same video content, but what if they have different resolutions? So you have the same content, you compress that at 1080, 720, uh, 360, and all these kind of resolutions, 
And here, SimPlus is giving you some quality measure that gives you meaningful comparison that scores are comparable across these resolutions. You can imagine at extremely high resolution, probably you're always gonna pick 1080, right? So because you got perfect uh, compressed video out, so you, you will never choose 10, 720 because you have enough to compress 1080. But with the bandwidth uh, going down, right? So at certain point, you're gonna see more and more artifacts in your 1080 video uh, compared with 720 video. Then if you, you, you draw this rate quality curve, then the curve has to cross, right? So at certain point, a certain bit rate, uh, 1080 uh, video and 720 video were across, and so on. You have other resolutions. If you draw all of these uh, uh, rate, uh, rate uh, quality curve together, you're supposed to have come up with this convex heart uh, structure. Thanks for Netflix, and they, they put the, the ideal uh, convex heart uh, structure picture uh, uh, when they talk about prototype optimization. So uh, the thing is, SimPlus is, uh, automatically producing these convex heart structure automatically. So that's a uh, nice thing about this. The good thing about this is that you can then go with the, the uh, what we call quality uh, first uh, principle to do per title optimization. So uh, basically, we, I'm gonna have a, another talk uh, today at 2.45 um, uh, at a discovery track. Um, just talk about, uh, talk more about uh, quality evaluation, the per title Organization. If you're interested, you can you can come uh, come to the talk, and also you can always come to our uh, Sim SimWaves uh, booth at uh, two seventeen. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Joe. We're gonna let Anne Aaron uh, describe a little bit about her work at Netflix. One slide. So, so as I mentioned at the start, the goal of our team is to encode. Jessica Jones at the best quality possible. So I'm using her because uh, we're not so far from Hell's Kitchen where she lives. Um, so yeah, so the, to be able to achieve this goal of encoding the best quality video, uh, we do a few things. One is that we, we run coded comparisons, you know, comparing encoders, Beamer, X65, um, uh, X64, uh, two Orioles, I see Ronald there. Um, so we, we compare codecs um, and standards. Uh, we, we, we develop our own um, encoding algorithms, optimization algorithms. For example, it was mentioned per title optimization. Uh, more recently, we developed shop-based dynamic optimization. And last but not the least, we have to make sure that the quality is good end-to-end. -end. So our developers or engineers are not introducing bugs in the system that cause bad video. And at the end, like after the adaptive streaming algorithm works, that we're still delivering high-quality video. To do all this, it's just not really possible to do subjective evaluation. So we had to, we knew, um, and as mentioned, all compression folks know that PSNR is just not good for, sub, for perceptual quality, even though we all use PSNR. So it was just really out of necessity that we had to develop a video quality metric that we could use for our jobs. Um, and we, we, there were a few goals that we wanted. First, it was very accurate in, in reflecting human perception. And second, we, we should be able to run it at scale to achieve all these three, three objectives. And later on, we realized that um, it was also good to open, a, open it up to the industry, um, to open source it, um, and primarily because in running these codec evaluations, um, we, we, we would like to improve the standards, and for us to be able to influence and improve the standards, this quality metrics has to be accepted and validated by the entire industry. Um, so that's why we, we also wanted then to open source it. Next slide. So how did we attack this problem? Um, uh, first, we actually generated ground truth data, and we were very targeted in generating the ground truth data. Um, first, you know, our, our type of content, so of course not just, not just action sequences like that, but diverse content, cartoons, um, um, uh, uh, TV shows, movies. And from the distortion point of view, it was also targeted to the distortion that we were interested in. Um, compression artifacts as well as scaling artifacts because if you're, if you're adaptive streaming a low resolution video, it's gonna be upsampled at the receiver. So these were the two primary focus. You know, we didn't, we didn't really care about Gaussian noise. There's no, we don't introduce Gaussian noise or even packet losses because you know, we're not delivering, we weren't delivering using UDP. So it's very targeted. And given the, and also in terms of the viewing condition, also very targeted, you know, using a TV. And then using this ground truth data, we extracted features. 
Uh, from the feature point of view, we, we didn't want to reinvent the wheel, so we, we dug through academic research and found the quality metrics that were based on the human visual system too, um, and to reuse those and then fuse them together. Um, and by fusing these different quality metrics that other, other folks had developed, hopefully we get a better quality metric that more accurately um, reflects perception, uh, human perception. So if one quality metric doesn't work well in a type of content, maybe the other quality metric can push the score towards the right direction. So um, because we had a very targeted setup, um, uh, we, so the current model supports 1080p video on a 1080p viewing. Uh, and later on, we realized that part of our job, again, we wanted to optimize the viewing for, us, for cell phones and tablets, so we expanded our ground truth data to also capture uh, uh, cell phone viewing. And so now we have both a TV and a mobile viewing model. We also actually ran tests in 4K, because we also stream a lot of 4K, and so we also have that 4K model in-house, which we plan to open source soon, too. Uh, we didn't just develop this ourselves. We also had partners in academia, like University of Southern California, New University of Texas at Austin, where um, Professor Wang is from, where they developed SSIM, and University of Nantes, which has a really good lab for subjective testing. So how does this work? Does this really reflect human perception? Uh, we, I, we, we tested the top two tables are tests that we ran ourselves. Um, and uh, can you click one more, please? Yeah, and, and as mentioned, to know whether it correlates with human perception, you have to have a correlation score of one. That's perfect correlation. When we tested on our test data set, so this is not what we use for training, but quite similar, we have a correlation of 0.93, which is good. But as you can see, it's not perfect. Um, the live video database is a really, really hard database to test on. Um, you know, we only took the one that's compression relevant impairments. Um, as you can see, all the other metrics are pretty terrible to like 0.5 correlation, 0.4 correlation. We're 0.7, not yet perfect, but getting close. Uh, we're seeing a lot of other uh, folks also validating VMAF since we've, we've open sourced it. And this is just something that was uh, reported recently at VQEG um, on the other data sets. And as you can see, it's pretty good correlation, point, point 0.95, which we're happy about. And, and we're starting to see some adoption. I was recently at NAB and saw a bunch of folks on the floor uh, starting to use VMAF too. Um, okay. So here, since this is about best practices, um, and we run a lot of codec comparisons, um, here are just some of the things that we've learned over, f over the last couple of years. First, um, make, use bitrate and QP resolution pairs. It just makes sense. Uh, that's one of our pet peeves in a lot of academic fixed QP evaluations. You know, you test 4K with a really, really high QP. On the field, folks are not going to use that, right? If, it's, if you have low bitrate, you're probably not going to stream 4K at a QP of 60. 60, you're going to go to a low resolution. So when we do our tests, we have to make, we make sure that we only test on the relevant parts, relevant QP bit rates and uh, selection so that, you know, the, so that results, results are actually relevant. I mentioned that we really like VMAF, you know, we developed it for our use case, but to make sure that we're not missing any corner cases that in VMAP, because it's still under development, we cross-check with other quality metrics like PSNR and VIF and, and VQM, uh, just to make sure that we're not missing anything. Uh, the, another important thing is you have to keep in mind the target viewing condition, because you know people will perceive the video different ways depending on how they're viewing it. So you have to keep that in mind. Eventually, if you're trying to optimize for your user base, your member base, you might want to average it based on the histogram of your members, but that's something to keep in mind, though. Last but not the least, you have to use diverse content. So a lot of tests out there, too, um, st in standardization, for example, use a handful of test sequences 10 seconds long. You know, you're, you're never going to capture all the capabilities of the codex, so um, that's not enough. Um, you just have to use more, 30 at least, 50 or even more if, if you can. Hand it over. All right, thanks, Ann. Um, so a couple more tips uh, before we take some questions. Um, you'll notice in encoders that they'll have oftentimes a tune PSNR, tune SSIM setting, and that's there for a reason. Um, as an encoder developer, I can tell you that uh, we face a dilemma. We know there are certain algorithms that can improve subjective visual quality, uh, psychovisual enhancements, things like uh, macro block tree or CU tree, um, PsiRD, PsiRDOQ, um, adaptive quantization, and they work. Uh, but uh, 
they do depress objective quality metric scores. Um, so do we keep them on by default and have the default settings for the encoder uh, give the best visual quality? Of course, that's what we want to do. Uh, now if somebody's going to publish a study with our encoder and they're going to use the default settings, um, the PSNR and SSIM scores aren't going to look so great, uh, especially against another encoder that the default settings were optimized for the best possible objective quality scores. So don't mix an objective quality test uh, with a subjective test and the same set of encodes. Um, do one set of encodes with the tuning and use the appropriate metric to score the encoders. Uh, do another set of encodes optimized for visual quality and use your eyes. Uh, but don't mix results from one test set with the other. Uh, great, so thanks everyone for your help in putting the little overview together. Um, we have uh, time for some questions, a little bit of time, so if anyone in the audience has uh, any relevant questions, just let me know. Yes? Question for Scott. Have you guys a BAM tech for this to sort of test sequences on testing? The question is, uh, has BAM tech produced any test sequences that uh, you would make publicly available? Um, so with BAM Tech and Disney, the question is now different, right? Because and, uh, and and at Disney there are some test sequences. I'm not sure about their availability, but we have given them to different video um, encoder manufacturers. Um, uh, Beamer, for example, has had those. Um, BAM Tech, as a general business, though, uh, historically has been one of aggregating content from a lot of different service pro other uh, you know content providers. Um, now we obviously had an association with baseball, um, and so had sequences from there but most other content that would not be the case, right? For us to be able to give rights out to, you know, hockey content or other sports avenues. Um, but I think it's, a, it's an interesting topic because I think that even as Ann said, you know, our industry um, all benefits by, by making such clips available. And there certainly have been, you know, scenes that we know cause problems historically. You know, you end the, end the Super Bowl or you pick your favorite sport event and the ticker starts flying and, you know, there goes there the, go. the bottom of your confetti. encoder. Confetti. You know, confetti, right. The Sorry, not the ticker, it's the confetti. Confetti with uh, grass. Exactly. So, Scott, I think there's a couple hundred votes here for more content that we can all use to, uh, to evaluate encoders with publicly. Uh, other questions? I don't see one, so I'll uh, ask a question myself. Um, how do you guys deal with uh, different devices in the installed base of your clients or, or end users? Um, I'm sure you track that as you stream content through the web. You, you know what types of clients people are using, uh, which is going to vary over time. Uh, but you know, let, let's start with Anne. How do you, how do you deal with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, so at first, when we developed VMAP, for example, we targeted the viewing condition that, mo that many members um, use. So for example, um, is it so a TV living room condition? And so that, we had to be focused on that because when we encode video, we can't really encode it specific per device. Um, so we just chose a device. But as, we, as our member base um, went more global, more people were using their cell phones. Um, and so that's when we realized that we also needed to develop a metric as well as optimize for that type of condition. And Scott, how do you? Uh, I mean, something similar. I mean, we have connected devices labs. We have mobile device labs that have just an enormous number of end devices. But you know, viewing on those is challenging, as, as Anne said, you know, and as John said, as what well, Joe said as well. Just sub, you know, being able to have sub subjective testing across those devices um, is, is a huge expense in terms of just manpower. Um, and because we all, for the most part, deal, deal with an adaptive bitrate world, where we've, we're not only just producing one bitrate, right? If I was in a broadcast industry and I was delivering one stream to a set-top box, that's not the domain that we're in. So we're having to deal with the fact that we've got multiple resolutions, multiple bit rates, and we need to know exactly how each of these actually look on these respective devices. You know, what does the 500 kilobit stream look like on a 1080p display? And, 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 and similarly, what does this high bit rate one look like on a small display? Um, and do we need to do that? So and, and not only are we looking for optimizing our, um, our bit rates and our stacks, but also potentially our manifest that we deliver to particular devices for, to, you know, to help guide um, you know, uh, and refine the adaptation logic that a device might consume by refining what, uh, what stacks they actually get. OK. Mm -hmm. And um, how about ABR streaming? We know that uh, you know, 
ideally, your end user is, uh, has the bandwidth to be able to get the highest quality tier, but that's not always the case. And, and so how much, um, how, how does that affect the way you evaluate? Uh, do you focus most of your attention on, on the top quality tier, or do you uh, really focus on those intermediate tiers where the challenge is greatest? Let's, let's start with Zhao. How do you yeah, look so, at that? Yeah, uh, so that's a very good question. So uh, um, the first thing is, uh, uh, in my uh, research lab, we do both subjective testing and objective testing, including uh, testing on different devices. Actually, one of the slides I showed earlier, the scatter plot, was uh, that those data points are come, uh, coming from different um, uh, devices uh, like phone, TV, and, and, and laptop, and so on. Right, so we have also done uh, both subjective testing and objective testing for video streaming. So basically, when you design objective quality metrics, so for example, taking SimPlus as an example, it is taking into account um, uh, device dependency, viewing conditions, like uh, for example, the, uh, the, the resolution, the physical size, the viewing condition, the brightness of your device, all of these parameters are taken into account because we are using a human visual system based uh, model. So these models will need these, uh, these parameters. So uh, in other words, uh, once you develop a model like this, then it will automatically apply to thousands of devices. Because you don't have to do uh, uh, your subjective testing with a thousand different devices and to draw that conclusion or, or, or to train your model. If you develop a human visual system based model, that's going to be something really good. And also, SimPlus has been combined with uh, freezing and uh, uh, quality adaptation that exactly these adaptive streaming uh, use cases that consider all these into the same metric. So basically, in the end, all you need is to use this kind of metric to drive your decision. Either it's about encoder or uh, streaming. So the optimization can be done at the encoder side, can also be done uh, during the, the streaming strategy, uh, the streaming decisions uh, you're right. trying to make. And Anne, I know you spend a lot of time worrying about that. Yeah, um, it, when um, it, actually in many cases, the improvements in the codec, whether it's a codec standard or the encoder itself, has most impact in the lower end of the bitrate range, right? If you have 20 megabit per second fiber, um, a 10% reduction in bitrate probably doesn't matter. But if you're in places in the world where you have 500 kilobits per second or much lower, that's where the codec improvements, let's say from one generation to the next, really impact. It brings, it brings your viewing experience from something really not watchable with lots of, um, with lots of rebuffers and lots of you know, really messed up faces to something that's watchable. So we do focus a lot on the low bit rate range. And just a little plug, we do have some demos um, of 100 kilobits per second AV1 because we've been focusing our effort in, on that bit rate range, 100 kilobits per second, 200 kilobits per second, so that many places in the world where it's cellular first, people can watch it. So that's how it affects our, um, our evaluation. And Scott, you, you track that also? Uh, we do, and I, I want to compliment um, Anne on her last comment about AV1 and, and low bit rate. Um, five years ago at Cisco, we were doing an evaluation of HVC um, um, technology, and it was very raw, very new. Um, from a multitude of vendors. And one of the things that we saw was that even though the, 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 the encoder itself, um, the, uh, the algorithms, et cetera, can cover a wide range of, of resolutions um, and bit rates, that many of the manufacturers, the, the, you know, include Beamer in this equation as well, um, were focusing on the latest hotspot, which was 4K. And so what we found was that you know, an encoder performed really well, for example, you know, at 4K or 1080p60, but when then you looked at some of the lower bit rates or resolutions, they really dropped off. You know? so, the so advantage ask, versus the Yeah, the image, the quality, the, the compression efficiency. And when you, we spoke to particular vendors, like, well, you know, that's, we're just not focusing on that. And, and that was okay, because this was you know, five years ago. But it is a challenge. You know, video encoding technology continues to evolve. Um, any encoder that you have today, it should be very different, you know, four or five years from now. They should continue to evolve, you know, the, the, the science and the art that they put in making the encoding better. Um, and for us as a business, we, we do focus on both ends. You know, it's just, you know, most, almost all of our business are subscription based. And so we want to make sure that there's that premium quality experience um, for the user that can get the high bit rates. But we know that things can happen. Um, and so we also want to make sure that we're optimizing for the low end as well. So there is a, it's, 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 we have to cover the gamut. And today, more and more customers have decent bandwidth, and they're able to get the highest quality tier. But there's still a, a, a significant portion that are in a bandwidth-constrained viewing environment, right? Where in this case, yes. they're at a hotel, like <laughs> we are, and uh, they want to watch something that's going on right now. And uh, no matter what, they want a good experience, right? 
and no buffering, please. Um, any other questions from the audience? Do we? Uh, Oliver. Question for Anne, are there yeah. any new releases that are yeah. being half planned and are there So, uh, so I mentioned 4K, practices? but we're also running um, subjective tests right now in HDR because we haven't fully optimized encoding for our HDR stream. So we do stream HDR10 and, and Dolby Vision. I, uh, as you said, we, we, we work on the low end, but we also try to deliver like the, the, the most premium um, experience. So, so we're, we're expanding VMAF to also um, support HDR. And then the best... Are there best practices for uh, benchmarking two different encoders with VMAF? You, you know, what, what we do whenever we're benchmarking encoders, we're, we just we use them as if we would use them in production. So when we actually run codec comparisons, um, a few people in the team here who, who, do, who do the codec comparisons, we integrate it into our encoding pipeline and run it as if we were going to run it in production. That's basically, because at the end of the day, that's what you want to see, what our members are going to actually see on the field. So we don't do fixed QP, we just run it. So for example, our latest algorithm was uh, shot-based dynamic optimi optimization. So that's how we're running our codec comparisons, you know, integrate AV1, integrate um, HVC codecs into that shot-based encoding, um, shot-based framework. And I want to give a pitch for joining and collaborating in uh, the open source effort of VMAF, right? It's fantastic that Netflix uh, invested a lot of resources in developing this great uh, objective quality metric. And they're definitely looking for people to contribute. So the code is open source. You can contribute your own improvements, whether they're speed or other types of uh, improvements. And, and that team's looking for people to join with them. Um, other questions? Yes. So the question is, uh, when you have a live production and then later it's available on demand, do you take the live encode or do you do a re-encode? Um, so we'll do both. Um, and it'll depend on partner. Our partners are customers. Um, so often, we, you know, there may be a live production, a linear event, and the archive after that just becomes the live to VOD transition. Uh, but often we're also doing a, a higher bit rate MES um, encode capture of that asset at the same time. So a live event is going on. We've got a live uh, uh, encode, higher bit rate, of course. Uh, and then there is a subsequent uh, um, two-pass or multi-pass transcode on it on the back end side. Fantastic. Uh, more questions? Yes. So let me repeat the question um, for the live listeners. Uh, um, for a live encode, uh, this gentleman is using a fixed GOP, so they're not uh, doing adaptive GOP, uh, placing the start of GOPs at new scene changes, and he's noticing uh, some quality issues that'll happen um, around the scene changes in the middle of a GOP. Are there any recommendations for that? Um, I guess we'll go to Mr. Live Encoding here, Scott Labrosi. Uh, you know, we only have to, uh, uh, like a minute, so this might be a question that you can you know, feel free to come up with me, because this is a big pet beef of mine. Um, and I think it's unfortunate that the industry, um, the uh, adaptive bit rate specifications mostly grew out of VOD offline concerns. Um, and then we kind of backed in, we kind of fixed, fixed things and patched things for live. Um, you know, two years ago, I was just completely involved with the Dash IF live group talking about, you know, these are the things that happen in live productions that you need to be concerned about. That is, but that's not addressing your question. I absolutely agree that, um, you know, the constraints of very rigid fixed GOP, five second segments, whatever it has to be, has a huge detriment in quality, right? And so I'm very much an advocate for loosening those boundaries in encoders, um, whether it's for VOD or also for live. 
and being able to dynamically change you know, your GOP structure, et cetera, for anticipation. Now, of course, that means you need to have a look ahead, which introduces some amount of latency, but I think that the quality you know, certainly benefits. The last thing you want to do is have a forced uh, you know, scene uh, segment boundary, and then one frame later is a scene change, and you've had to put two IDRs back to back. Uh, yeah, so and as, as an encoder developer, I would second that motion. Um, you know, ideally, you want flexible GOP structure. You want to uh, have scene detection on. You want to be able to start a new GOP at the start of a new scene. Um, initially, when people started streaming video, it was all fixed GOP because it made things simpler for the audio and the video all to be fixed and the packager and so on. Uh, but more and more, the top companies are going to a flexible GOP length. Um, even for live, right, now if you had an extreme low latency situation, that might be impractical, but if you have some end-to-end -end latency that you can tolerate, um, you know, working towards that is, uh, should be a goal, yeah. for sure. Yeah, unless your underlying encoder is doing all of the rates, and usually what you will do is instantiate multiple encoders for different bit rates, um, you have to front end this with something that's making these decisions for you. Um, within an encoder, its decision about scene change is is somewhat complex, and so one encoder instance at a particular resolution or bit rate will make its scene change thresholds different than another. Um, and so you have to have some type of control outside that's basically doing the look ahead and scene analysis, and then basically forcing um, the encoder. Now there have been advancements, some of encoders, this goes back probably about another five or six years ago, and I know we're pretty much out of time here. Um, I began to advocate to encoding manufacturers, encoding to IP, that they begin to do what's notion of a multi-resolution, multi-bit rate encoder. So you instantiate one encoder, and out of that encoder you get multiple bit rates and multiple resolutions. And so you can, that helps obfuscate this problem particularly. So when you're evaluating an encoder, that might be a feature that you might, might want to look for. So thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're at the top of the hour. Um, we're available to take questions if you have any um, uh, after the presentation. So thanks. Thank you.